What's in your eye? Anything I can rectify? <laughs> Just a stray eyelash, Tech. But since when were you a poet? Ah, my boy, spring is in the air. <laughs> in that case, Tech, how about springing back to being a master technician? I'd like to give Cy an eyeful of the features of this new Plymouth B-8 engine. At your service, Matt. Uh, was that what you were about to do when Cy called time out? Yeah, Tech. I'm trying to open his eyes to something new, and he keeps trying to keep his eyes shut. Oh, now that's not fair. I really thought I got a cinder in my eye. It sure fell as big as a baseball. But where were we? Oh, I remember. You just started to say something about higher compression ratio. Higher compression is right. Eight to one, in fact. There's more displacement, too. 277 cubic inches, so you've got a real powerhouse to talk about. Same combustion chamber? No, Cy. It's been redesigned to eliminate surface pockets. The spark plug electrodes are nearer the center, too. This brings about two benefits. First, the air-fuel mixture flows more smoothly through the chamber. Second, the mixture is burned more evenly and completely. So the new combustion chamber design is a lot more efficient. The valves are larger, too, Cy. This, along with other design features, contributes to better breathing and longer valve life. And speaking of valves, Cy, this new Hi-Fire V8 uses mechanical tappets. Mechanical? How come? Very simple, Cy. It's just that this design lends itself to the use of mechanical tappets. Are you telling, Matt? Now, look, Cy, I know the trend lately has been toward the use of hydraulic tappets. That's because most valve trains on recent engines have been pretty long, and a lot of expansion has been involved. But on this new Plymouth engine, the valve train is three to four inches shorter in length. Valve stems and push rods are shorter. There's a different size block and an entirely new valve train geometry. As a result, there's less change in valve lash due to expansion in the valve train. That's why mechanical tappets can be used. You don't need the automatic adjusting feature of hydraulic tappets to control tappet clearance. The camshaft side was redesigned to provide cams with quieting ramps long enough so valve noise will be reduced to a minimum. Right. Now, what you're shooting for, of course, is a smooth, quiet running engine with intake valves set at 8,000s clearance and exhaust valves set at 18,000s clearance. That's clear enough, but I'm wondering, is it hard to adjust those mechanical tappets? Not at all, Si. It's really very easy. Just remember that you always set tappet clearances with the engine hot and running. You check the clearance at the valve stem and adjust it by turning the self-locking screw at the push rod end of the rocker arm. Say, that is pretty simple. Now, are there any other new features? Oh, there sure are, Cy. Engine cooling, for one, has been improved. There are full-length water jackets that completely surround each cylinder. The block is longer for more space between bores, which also means better cooling. The intake manifold is new also. It has a water passage at the front leading to the radiator inlet. In addition, a new automatic choke is used and is located in a pocket in the exhaust crossover passage of the intake manifold. Other new features, Cy, are the spark plugs, the lubrication system, and the crankcase ventilation system. And besides those, Tech, maybe we'd better tell Cy about the new type of engine mounts. Engine mounts? What in blazes can be new about the mounts? Easy, boy. There's been a big change in the mounts, and Matt can give you that story. Yeah, I can. Now, there are two mounts at the front and one at the rear. The mounts on the frame at the front are in a vertical plane. Engine vibration forces act through the rubber in a direction parallel to the plates. In other words, in shear. As a matter of fact, they are called shear-type mountings. They are especially good at damping out engine low-speed vibration effects. It's one big reason why this engine has such a smooth idle side. I see, fellas. Now, you were saying something about a new engine lubrication system. Was that brought about because of the mechanical tappets? No, Cy. Improvements in engine lubrication are always made to protect engine life and better the performance when possible. But in the case of the tappets, plenty of lubrication has been provided. A tappet bore in the cylinder block actually cuts through the main oil gallery. As a result, 
The Tappet gets a constant oil bath during operation. Rocker arms get their share of oil, too. The arms are mounted on a shaft supported in struts that are integral with the cylinder head. Oil is forced through the rocker arm shaft and through a small hole in the shaft to the clearance between the shaft and rocker arm. Oil that squeezes out at that point drains back to the crankcase. You pointed out some good features of the new lubrication system, Matt. But how about tracing the oil flow from the time the oil leaves the crankcase? That's a good suggestion, Tech. Now, Si, once the oil's drawn into the floating oil intake, it goes into a vertical passage in the block. A, a new check valve at this point acts as an oil flow traffic officer. Now, for example, oil pressure opens the ball check valve. This, in turn, admits oil to a horizontal passage leading to a full-flow oil filter. Full flow, hey? Yeah. Oil is forced through the filter and back through another passage that leads to the main oil gallery. From there, it goes to each main and camshaft bearing. From the number two and four camshaft bearings, oil passages lead to the cylinder heads and up to the rocker arm shafts. The passage from the number two camshaft bearing indexes with the cylinder head bolt hole through the second from the front rocker arm shaft strut of the left cylinder head. The passage from the number four camshaft bearing indexes with the cylinder head bolt hole through the second from the rear rocker arm shaft strut of the right cylinder head. Holy cow, Matt. That sounds like who's on first. I'll bet you can't unscramble that so Si and I both can understand it. <laughs> yeah, maybe you're right, Tech. Well, I'll see if I can unconfuse the explanation. Now, look. Oil comes up a passage from the number two camshaft bearing. This passage indexes with a cylinder bolt hole. This hole goes through a rocker arm shaft strut on the left cylinder head. Sure. And that rocker arm shaft strut you're talking about is this baby, the second one from the front. All right, Si, don't help Matt out. I want to see if he can make it clear. <laughs> okay. Now, oil from the number four camshaft bearing also goes up the same kind of a passage. This passage indexes with a cylinder head bolt hole on the right cylinder head. The bolt hole, in this case, is the one going through the rocker arm shaft strut at this location. The second one from the rear of the engine. Hooray, Matt, you did it. Sign, I understood you that time. <laughs> Fine. Now, after lubricating the rocker arm bores, some of the oil is forced through drilled passages in the rocker arms for two other important lubricating jobs. It lubricates the self-locking screw at the ball end that fits into the push rod. Also, it lubricates the valve stem end touching the rocker arm. Intake and exhaust valve rocker arms are drilled differently to accomplish these two jobs. Nice going, Matt. Now, somebody please turn the record so we can cover some other new engine features. Now, uh, up to this point, Si, we've called out the new engine features, and we've given you some idea on how oil circulates. Any questions? Well, now that you mention it, I'm still a little hazy on what that check valve does in the engine oil system. Good question, Si. Actually, it works as a combination check valve and bypass valve. Tech's right. The check valve is in a vertical passage in the block and admits oil to a horizontal passage. It also acts as a check to retain oil in the passages, oil filter, and oil gallery when the engine isn't running. Uh, just above the check valve side is the bypass valve. If the oil filter ever gets plugged, oil pressure lifts the disc in the bypass valve to let the oil through. Now, with that bypass open, Si, oil can flow from the pump directly to the main gallery without going through the filter. That ensures lubrication for the engine if an owner forgets to replace the filter. That clears up the check valve, and it looks to me like a pretty good engine protection. That it is, my boy. Now, another feature protecting the engine is an improved crankcase ventilation system. Tech's right. Inlet and outlet pipes in this new ventilation system have different locations, so let's explain what happens. Now, for instance, 
forward motion of the car creates suction around the outlet pipe at the rear of the right rocker arm cover. Now, this, of course, draws air and crankcase vapors out of the engine through the draft created by fresh air entering the crankcase combination oil filler cap and air filter. Now, this inlet is at the forward end of the left cylinder bank. The valve rocker arm chambers and the valve tappet chamber are also ventilated along with the crankcase. Right, and the entire ventilation system keeps engine oil free from contamination. So more of the engine gets ventilated, eh? That's the idea, Si. Now, let's talk about another new engine feature. On the water pump, for instance. The water pump housing on this engine is a part of the timing chain case cover. The cover, in other words, forms the water pump housing. That brings up an important point, Si. Those chain case cover attaching screws are sealed to prevent water and oil leaks. So if you take the cover off, be sure to seal them when you install the cover. All right, Tech. I'll keep that in mind. Now, here's something else. The impeller in that water pump is made of plastic. Yeah, and there are some special instructions in the reference book about replacing that impeller. You better read up on that. Okay, Tech. Will do. That a boy, Si. Now... You know about the new location of the automatic choke, but I haven't told you yet about its operation. Let's see. The coil and housing are mounted in a well in the exhaust crossover of the intake manifold. Right. And the rod connects the coil with the choke valve operating lever. A bimetallic coil spring holds the choke valve closed. A vacuum piston tries to open the valve. As the bimetallic coil spring heats up, it unwinds and allows the choke valve to open. The vacuum-operated piston connected to the choke valve also helps open the valve. Now, the vacuum passage to the piston is in the carburetor body. Therefore, it uses filtered air from the carburetor air horn, so failure due to dirt is practically eliminated. Relocating the choke coil in the exhaust crossover also ties it in better with actual engine operating temperatures. The coil reacts more directly to true engine heat. Uh Uh-huh. What's the advantage of that? Well, just this, Si. It practically does away with over-choking and under-choking, two main causes of engine stalling and faltering. I get it. Now, will a choke ever need adjustment? Well, not very likely, Si. But if it does, just loosen the hold-down bolts and remove the choke from its pocket in the intake manifold. Next... Loosen the shaft nut. Then turn the adjusting plate toward lean or rich. It's stamped L and R on the cover. Ordinarily, Si, you tell if the choke's working okay just by moving the choke rod up and down. It should work freely without binding. Sounds easy enough to me. Anything else? Well, when checking the choke, be sure the manifold heat control valve moves freely also. A stuck heat valve won't let the choke coil warm up properly and will result in poor choke operation. I see. The two are tied in together. Where is the heat valve on this engine? It's now integral with the right exhaust manifold, Si. The uh, counterweight acts also as an air shield for the bimetallic coil. When the engine is cold or idling, the heat valve is closed. This directs hot gases through the exhaust crossover passage and applies heat to the carburetor hot spot. That, in turn, helps vaporize the fuel mixture for smooth engine idle and faster warm-up. Now, during acceleration and after warm-up, and also at higher speeds, the heat valve opens. This cuts down exhaust gas flow to the hot spot. As a result, you get better breathing and greater power output at higher speeds. Yeah, and because of the air shield effect of the counterweight, the coil is not cooled by the fan blast so it doesn't stay closed so long. Right. The heat control valve operation is tied in closer with engine temperature. As a result, you get proper warm-up, a reduction in back pressure after warm-up, and the engine operates more efficiently. So that's how the new heat valve improves performance. Correct. Now you have a good picture of some of the new engine features. As long as everything's adjusted to specifications, the owner will enjoy better combustion, more power, and greater economy. Just by way of reminder, Matt, what were those tappet clearances? 
eight thousandths on the intake valve side and eighteen thousandths on the exhaust valves. Now, that's a hot setting, incidentally. It's important to check that tappet clearance every time the car comes in for an engine tune-up. Check the clearance with the engine idling at normal operating temperature. Okay, will do. Spark plugs used in this engine are different, too. The porcelain tip has been extended, which puts the electrodes closer to the center of the combustion chamber for smoother and more complete burning of the mixture. Since the longer porcelain tip means more distance between the tip and the spark plug case, there's less chance of the plug shorting out from deposits building up. So there's less fouling, along with more efficient operation over a wider heat range. You adjust those plugs to a 35,000 gap size and don't bump the electrodes during installation or you'll change that setting. I'll be careful, Tech. Uh, that distributor, remember, uses a single set of contact points, Si. We still setting them at 18 thousandths? 18 thousandths is right, Si. Ignition timing, by the way, should be set four degrees before top dead center. Yeah, but if the grade of fuel varies in different localities, you can vary the timing setting slightly. Right, and if premium fuel is preferred by the owner, you can advance timing, but not more than eight degrees before top dead center. Okay, but I suppose regular fuel is still another nice feature about this engine. Right, Si. Now, here's something else. Be sure the cylinder heads are properly tightened. If they aren't, a water leak might show up. Now, what you do, remember, is torque the center bolt of the inner row to 85 foot-pounds, then get the one below it. Alternate tightening the inner and outer rows working out to the ends. Remember, the sequence of tightening is very important. Yeah, I know, Matt. Fine. Now, if you ever have to install a new gasket, be sure it's free from nicks. Also see that the block edges are clean and free from burrs. To install the head, use a two-step tightening sequence. First, snug down the bolts to about 40 foot-pounds in proper sequence. Then go back in order and tighten the bolts to 85 foot-pounds. Golly, tightening that head properly must be mighty important. It sure is, my boy, and don't you forget it. Now, the carburetor, Si, you adjust like before. Set idle at 475 to 500 RPM, the engine at normal temperature, and the transmission in neutral. Setting fast idle is really simple. With the choke open, move the cam so the high point is under the fast idle screw. Adjust the screw to give you 1,400 RPM. Sounds like duck soup. You fellas have really cleared things up. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, Si. When you and all the boys know how to handle new features, it's not only easier on you, but it makes my job easier, too. Making things easier for technicians leads to better customer service. So keep well posted on Master Tech Topics, and you'll keep those customers coming your way. <laughs>